Thanks everybody for attending. I know it's hard on a Monday night to attend a CE course. And so um, I appreciate all of you attending and I wanna be really respectful of your time. So let's get into it. Um, I just wanna make sure all of you know, every handout for every educational session I give, I make available for free with no uh, subscription or membership or um, any time. I don't ask for anything back. I just wanna make sure that if you are interested in downloading my handouts, all you have to do is go on my website, bebetterseminars.com, go to the handouts link, and all of my handouts are available and they're for free. You can download them. You can use them however you want. And especially for this particular lecture, um, implant over dentures, there's so many parts and pieces. And you know, the first time that you do one of these cases, or the first time you restore a case, or the first time you do a, an edentulous surgical guide, it's going to be hard to remember all this stuff that I'm talking about from some random Wednesday in eight, some random Monday in April. And so download my implant over denture uh, uh, handout and just print it out and have it sitting in your operatory the next time you do one of these cases. I want to make it as easy as possible for you. The same handout is also available on the Catapult Education website um, under this actual course. So um, use it, use it. I, it will just make me happy knowing that I made your life a little bit easier. So um, you know what? I don't want to ask in the chat because I think it'll be a waste of time. But right now there's 135 people that are logged on right now. And my assumption is about half of you attended the lecture that I gave a few months ago that was all about the restorative aspect of an implant retained overdenture, where I went into choosing a locator, how to pick up your metal housing, how to fabricate your final denture, all of that kind of stuff. And I won't be talking about that stuff today because I talked about it a few months ago. What I wanted to uh, focus on today was the actual surgery. Um, but let me, I, I wanna just for anybody who's on this call, who's not totally clear of what an implant retained removable overdenture is. Let me just kind of walk you through it. So imagine a patient that is either partially or fully edentulous and coming from the edentulous space, there's something called a locator that's emerging from the gingiva. Okay, so that, that's what we're looking at in, in these cases. This is the clinical presentation for one of these cases. And then the denture itself inside of the denture has something called a retention cap. And that retention cap snaps into the locator. So here we have the inside of the denture. This is the, the intaglio surface of the denture. And embedded within the denture are these little things that we call retention caps. And what that does is it allows for the denture to snap in to your actual implant. Your implant is fixed, it's stable. And so now the denture can snap in and snap out. There we go. So it's a little bit more challenging now for a person to remove the denture. Um, and therefore it's a lot more retentive inside of the mouth and a patient's able to function a lot more. They're, they're gonna be much happier with it. That guy had some pretty gross saliva, sorry about that. And because you have a denture now that no longer relies on palatal suction or vestibular extension, you get to make a denture that's a lot more um, comfortable for the patient. And that's important because some patients, they just cannot tolerate palatal extension. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> what's wrong? I just feel uh, out of the air. <laughs> Is it hard to keep those in? It just <laughs> okay, I can tell it's hard to keep those in. Okay. Uh, Look at the guy. He's going to yak all over the place. He has his gag reflex is too strong. It doesn't, it doesn't, I could be the best denture maker in the world. Um, if I make him a traditional denture with palatal extension, uh, something that goes over the hamular notch, something that will, with a post dam that has this amazing suction, it wouldn't matter. The guy wouldn't be able to wear it because his gag reflex is too strong. And not only does it reduce palatal and vestibular extension, if you use implant retained over dentures in partials, then you don't need to use clasps anymore because all of your retention will come from the implant itself and not from any type of clasping. 
which is amazing. Uh, here you can see the underside of that denture. Um, you can see my thumb is where the tooth would normally be. Um, and now the denture, it actually snaps in to that locator rather than um, rather than clasping onto the teeth. So this is like, it just it's just a better service to be able to offer to patients. I used to hate making dentures. I now love it because it's incredibly gratifying. All right, Daryl, tell me, how do you like your lower dentures? I like them. They, they work real good for me. Yeah, try to take them out. All right, now snap them back in. Oh, she, let's, see, let's see the hardware. Let's see the hardware. Let's see those implants in there. Open. I did these Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, now snap them in. There, I, I heard the snap. Is there anything you can't eat? No, no, no. I can eat anything I want to eat. I can eat anything I want to eat. That's great. So the reason I, I love this video is because th this guy, he went about 23 years with traditional dentures and he had so many limitations in his life. Uh, so many limitations when it came to social events, smiling, laughing, uh, being able to choose certain foods. And when he trusted me with the responsibility of making him an implant retained denture, I completely changed his life. And a lot of times as a dentist, I don't change people's lives when I do a root canal. I don't change people's lives when I do a do a, a crown or a filling. I, I do a nice service. But in, in a case with these implant retained overdentures, you're taking people who've been very frustrated in their lives and you can completely change them. That's really gratifying. So why don't all dentists do it? It's because the parts and pieces are tiny. They're complicated. Implants are intimidating. We all hate dentures and we're not really sure where to start. And that was the whole reason why I decided to offer this course to Catapult um, because I want to make it so that any of you who are kind of interested in adding this to your treatment repertoire, you can do it. You, it's, it's actually easier than you think. And I'm just kind of here to provide you with the step-by-step -step instructions, okay? Now, I'm only going to talk about surgery and surgical uh, planning, the, the surgery itself, and what to do once the implants are integrated. Um, the reason I'm not going to talk about the fabrication of the denture and the restorative steps is because I already did that. I did that a couple months ago, and that particular lecture is available on demand on the Catapult site. So if you go to Catapult Education, you go to where it says CE Courses, and you'll be able to find, if you uh, scroll down to where it says on-demand classes, you'll be able to find the lecture that I gave several months ago about implant overdentures, the restorative components. And so, um, let's see, let me see if I can find it here. Hmm, they have a lot of classes uh, with Catapult. Um, there it is, implant re retained removables, you'll be able to find that and you'll be able to register for that class and take it on demand uh, whenever you like. And so uh, it's super easy to do that. And once you take that course, once you take that course, um, you'll, I'm telling you, you'll feel very ready to um, add this to your repertoire. So let me tell you the rules of surgery. And these rules were, I didn't come up with these, okay? I, um, I think I, were, I was told the, these rules at a Strawman course that I took like 12 years ago. And they said, if you're going to have implant retained overdentures, your implants can diverge, but no more than 14 degrees. And I know that some of you are like, wait, how do you measure that? I have no idea how to measure that. I don't have like a protractor or something like that. I'm not, I don't know what 14 degrees is. All I know is I want my implants to be somewhat parallel. Okay. If you're using only two implants, maybe because the patient can afford only two implants or there's only enough bone to place two implants, your denture is going to rock a little bit. Uh, your implants should be placed about 10 millimeters apart. I have made the mistake before where I've made my implants too close to each other, and that's actually created a few problems for me. Um, in nearly 100% of cases, if you have four implants, you're going to have a beautiful case. Four implants that are parallel and they're about 10 millimeters apart, you're gonna be able to, that patient is gonna be incredibly happy with the result, okay? If bone width is a concern, 
or if a patient isn't will willing to wait for full integration. Let's say a patient is like, I don't want to... I don't want to wear an interim denture that doesn't snap in ever. That's when you would consider something like an O-ball mini implant. Um, and the last rule is for partial dentures. If you're going to place an implant in the edentulous space in between teeth, you got to make sure that your implant isn't too close to one of those teeth. It'll create an overhang and it's going to be a nightmare to restore. Okay. So these are just some cases that I've done in the past where I feel like I followed those rules, okay? Implants are at least 10 millimeters apart. They're somewhat parallel. There's four. Um, they're going to work out pretty well. But in cases, whoops, in cases where bone width is a concern, these O-ball implants, they, wor they work. Okay, so let me, let me go back. Sorry. This one right over here. This patient here, I was going to ultimately make them a denture that would attach to these four larger implants that you see in the lower arch. But this patient was really uncomfortable with the idea of wearing an interim denture that wasn't going to snap in. So in a case like this, I threw in a couple O-ball mini implants. Now, I don't know how well they're going to integrate. I don't know how well they're going to perform long term, but it gave me an option so that the patient could snap in their interim denture. Okay. The problem with those O-ball implants is that they're, they're one piece. And so if they're one piece, you can't correct for any angle. And like, if you angle your implant the wrong way, you can't correct. That's impossible. It's one piece. And the second thing is that ball at the top when that wears out, you're screwed. You can't do any, you can't replace a worn out oval with these oval implants. And so even though there's a place for them, I don't use them very often. The only time I use them is when a patient doesn't want their interim denture to wobble around and I want, they want some stability. Okay. So, oh, and then again, for um, when you're placing an implant in, an edent in a partially edentulous area, try to be as far away from those adjacent teeth as possible. That'll make it easiest for you when it's time to restore, okay? So those are the rules of surgery. The problem is it's not that easy to follow all that rules, all of those rules just by kind of, kind of depending on your own hand skills and your own hand-eye coordination and your own clinical abilities. You know, sometimes I'm amazed at how different my idea of angulation or parallelism is just when I compare my view to the view of my assistant who's on the other side of that patient. Sometimes we want to follow all of these rules, but we can't because we're just limited with our own hand-eye coordination and our own clinical skills. And so one thing that I want to talk about is in, in today's age, we should be doing a lot more planning for implant surgery, okay? And I'm going to talk now about surgical planning, assuming that you have a CBCT, assuming that you have a scanner, and assuming that you have a surgical guide kit, okay? I'm going to assume that you have all of those things. I know a lot of you on this call don't, and that's okay. I did a lot of implants before I had a CBCT. I, had, I did a lot of implants before I had a scanner. I had, did a lot of implants before I used um, a surgical guide kit. But I think as technology continues to progress, more than likely, you're going to start doing surgeries that are guided so that you can do the most perfect job possible. So at some point in your career, you're going to migrate over to using these technologies. And I want to talk about basically what you need to do based on having these technologies. So um, there's 184 of you on this call. I would assume that probably about half of you have a CBCT. Um, and that's great. For those of you who don't, there's nothing to be ashamed of. But more than likely in the next five years, you'll probably get a CBCT. And so this is still going to be very relevant. Okay. So. Let's talk about scenario one. This is a patient who has teeth, but their teeth are just complete junk, okay? This guy knows that he needs all of his teeth pulled. 
and he really wants to restore those teeth, replace those teeth with a uh, with an implant retained over denture. Okay, so what's the first step that you're supposed to do? Well, my first step would be creating a surgical guide. Okay, and the goal of a guide is to is to make sure that your implants are parallel, that they're evenly distributed under the eventual denture, that they're surrounded by the most optimal bone, so that they're not gonna um, your implant isn't going to come out of a concavity or your implant's not going to go into the sinus or into a nerve. Um, your goal is to be able to do the surgery with the greatest amount of confidence that it's going to look great. And so using a got, using a CBCT and using a scanner, I have the opportunity then to have a consultation with my lab in which my lab tech and I have a conversation and my lab tech makes recommendations based on where I should place these implants. And these recommendations are based on the long-term restorative outcome. And that's sometimes, I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about the freaking denture when I'm doing the surgery. I just wanna make sure that I stick implants into bone. But what's nice about do, using a surgical guide and planning this all out is that your lab tech is already thinking in terms of the long-term prognosis. They're, um, the long-term, I'm sorry, the long-term restorative option, okay? So I, the, in order to be able to do this, I have to send a scan and a CBCT to my lab. And my lab tech basically guides me through location, implant size, um, how it, they should be distributed, parallelism, avoiding... Uh, anatomy, all of that kind of stuff. My lab tech's doing all of this stuff. I, I don't even know how to work the software here. My lab tech is the one who is determining the exact design of that surgical guide, where the implants are going to go, and how that surgical guide is going to fit after I pull some of those teeth. So I want you to look at this really quick because this is important. This guy has some teeth, right? but I need to place some implants in the optimal places. And so what, what my, my lab tech and I were able to do was determine which teeth we were gonna pull and which teeth we weren't gonna pull so that the surgical guide would still snap onto the patient's, uh, snap onto the patient's teeth the same way that a night guard would, but I would still be able to place implants into an edentulous area. So look at this picture pretty carefully. Hopefully you all can see my mouse. The dude's got a tooth right here. He's got a tooth right here. He's got a, he doesn't have a tooth right here. I think that's one of the places where we were gonna place the implant. And we were planning on placing an implant right here. So what my lab tech did was tell me, all right, Gupta, listen, before you get started, before you snap this thing on, um, pull a couple of these teeth so that it'll actually fit. Then when you snap it on, this thing is gonna serve as a guide that will tell you exactly where to place each one of those implants. That's really nice. Now, I don't even have to be smart. I just have to, I mean, literally, when that patient's there, I get them numb, I lay a flap, I use my surgical guide along with these keys that are, the, these are, uh, this is the kit that's given to me by Implant Direct, who's one of the sponsors of this uh, of this webinar. And basically, I stick those keys into the surgical guide. I use my Implant Direct um, surgical kit. And now I don't even have to use my brain here. I'm literally sticking that drill exactly into that key. And it's going, yeah, let me mute it for a second. And it's going exactly where the implant is supposed to go. I don't have to use my brain. I don't have to. All I have to do is get that key put in place, at, step on the gas, and I'm putting osteotomies in the exact spot where they belong. Now, before I go on, I want to I want to make a really quick point. A lot of surgical guide CE courses are going to tell you that you don't you don't have to even check. Just let her rip. Just start, just, just put the surgical guide on and just start drilling away. I don't believe that's a good idea. I think that you should use your pilot drill and maybe your first drill with the surgical guide 
So you can see, and then remove the surgical guide and see where those holes are. Because like everything in life, these things, you know, it's humans. I mean, it's, it's a human patient. I'm a human dentist. My lab tech is a human. There might be a little bit of an error. So don't let her rip and just do the entire surgery under a surgical guide. Remove the surgical guide periodically so that you can make sure that your, that your implant and your osteotomy is in the ideal spot, okay? And as this video will show, I never place my implants through the surgical guide. I always remove my surgical guide and I place my implants directly where I can see exactly what I'm doing. Just because I've made the mistake of trusting my surgical guides too much in the past and I just don't wanna do that. Okay, so imagine you went through the process of doing a CBCT and a scan. You use your surgical guide to drill all the little holes in the bone exactly where they belong. Now, all you do is open up your implant. This is an implant direct implant. They're sponsors of the course and they're the implants that I prefer to use for cases like this. This is from their legacy line. And let's go over to that patient. And as you can see here, I have, I've laid a flap, but I've removed my surgical guide. I have a parallel pin helping me determine the parallelism of my dental implant. And now all I'm doing is placing the implant into the osteotomy site, knowing that I'm going to have excellent parallelism. I'm going to have excellent a distance. I'm going to have excellent distribution under my denture because I took the time to create a surgical guide in the first place, okay? Um, if you notice there, my, my handpiece, my drill, did not have enough strength to deliver the implant completely to the level of the bone. And so the rest of the, the placement of that dental implant, I'm going to use an actual ratchet for, a, a torque wrench or a ratchet. And so that is a torque driver that I'm basically lodging into the internal hex of my implant. And then I'm using a torque wrench or a ratchet to extend the rest of that implant all the way to the depth I want it, which is usually about the level of the bone or just a tiny bit below. And then I'm done with the surgery, okay? Um, one thing that I wanted to make clear to all of you is that I have made a very high level glossary with um, what all of these things are, what I mean when I say internal hex, um, all of that kind of stuff. I made this glossary, it's on my website, it's totally available to you. Um, there, I don't charge you anything or anything like that, but I wanna make sure that when you do this case, if you're not super experienced, all you have to do is just download this, download it, print it out, and uh, open it up to the page that you're that you're working, and you can just look at it in your operatory as you're doing the work. I want to make it as easy for you as possible. Okay, and then when you're done, so in this case, I placed my implants. After the implants were placed, I pulled the remainder of the teeth. I take a pan, and I'm proud of my pan. I know that this patient's going to be happy for the rest of their life. This patient is going to be happy for the rest of their life. This patient. It's gonna restore beautifully, no headaches. It's gonna be an awesome case. Same with this one, same with this one. And one thing I want to tell you is don't throw away the surgical guide after you're done with the surgery. It's all gross and it's all bloody. Wash it and put it back in the lab with your patient's case because you're gonna need it later. And I'll explain why in a second, okay? Now, one thing that I don't have time for today is all the cool, sophisticated grafting stuff. When you pull a tooth, it's it's important to graft after you pull a tooth. If you want to eventually place an implant in an area where you pulled a tooth, or if you're placing an implant immediately adjacent to an area where you pulled a tooth, it's important for you to graft. I'm going to skip the sophisticated stuff, and I still want to talk about something that you can do if you're not already an experienced clinician when it comes to bone grafting. So here I pull this dude's tooth. 
And I'm thinking, oh, I, I got to graph that thing. I got to shove something up there. I got to shove something up there so that in six months, a year, two years, five years, if this guy wants an implant, I got to stick something in there. And that's where I think all of you need to know about, about these, these plugs, these, these um, filler plugs. BioHorizons makes one called the Mineros. Osteogen makes one. And then Implant Direct, I just realized, Implant Direct, who, who I use primarily Implant Direct products, they have a plug as well. And I'm going to use their plug um, in the future. Um, but sticking a plug into that socket is a really easy way to do a bone graft, even if you don't have the education uh, where you're already, you already have a lot of skill and sophistication with bone grafting. Here, here's one of those plugs. This is the, uh, this is the osteogen plug uh, made by Implanent. Okay, so I took the plug. It looks kind of like a ear plug, doesn't it? And I just took my scissors and cut it so that it kind of looks like the roots of the tooth that I just pulled. And okay, okay, think about think about how smart I have to be, how big an IQ I have to have to do, ready, okay, I pull, to do that, to jam it in there. That's all I did, jam it in there, okay? And that actually ends up, maybe it's not as good uh, a high quality of a graph as with uh, particulate, but who cares? If you don't have the training and you're not confident with particulate grafting, then stick one of these in there because it's way better than nothing to do that. Okay. I want to talk about an already edentulous patient. You're going to have lots of patients that already have no teeth and they hate their denture. And they're like, doc, you got to help me. I have no teeth. I hate my denture. Can you fix me? And the temptation for you is going to be there to freehand your implants. And I freehanded for a long time. But all of those uh, panoramic x-rays that I showed you, those, those braggy panoramics that I showed er, uh, a couple minutes ago, none of those were my freehand cases. You know why? Because my freehand cases didn't look that pretty. They weren't that parallel. They were a little off. You know, one implant was yeah, a little bit. So, so if you really want to do it well, you're going to want to create, create a surgical guide. But how do you create a surgical guide when there's no teeth? I'll tell you how. First, buy these radio opaque markers. Um, all of your Banco, Patterson, Darby Dental, Shine, they sell radio opaque markers. Okay. So this is what you do you take the patient's current denture, okay, that they hate. And you, what you're going to do is use that denture to help you fabricate a surgical guide. And this is what you do. You add these little radio opaque markers. They're little stickers with little radio opaque dots on them. Okay. And you stick them all over the denture. Then you take a wash impression of that denture so that it, it fits in their mouth a little bit better. It has a little bit of a better retention. Then, and this is important, you have to take a CBCT of the patient with the denture and those markers stuck to it. Then you seat the patient and you take the, the denture itself, stick it on your CBCT platform and take a CBCT of it. And then lastly, you take a 360 scan of the denture. Um, these stickers, they are the, the ones I use are made by Shermark. Um, I'm sure there's a million different kinds. Um, but anyway, that's what you do. You stick them onto the denture. And if the patient doesn't already have a denture, you can have your lab make a little um, make a simple record base, okay? And then I take a scan, a 360 scan, a degree scan of the denture with those stickers stuck to it. Hopefully all of you are following me. And if you if you have any questions about this part, um, please just go to the Q&A or the chat. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I, I, uh, I have a little bit of time at the end of this lecture to answer those questions. Then I take that thing, I put it right on my CBCT platform and I, and I take a, a CBCT of it. And then this is what the stupid CBCT looks like. It's, it's just this, uh, it's like this thing with some dots on it, okay? That's all the CBCT looks like, but your lab wants that. And then you have the patient wear that denture with those stickers and you take a CBCT of that. And that's what you send to your lab. 
you send your lab the scan and the two CDCTs, okay? What the lab is then going to do is they're going to do the same exact thing that I talked about earlier in this lecture. They're going to analyze the CDCT. They're going to analyze the denture based on those, those markers. And they're going to be able to create an excellent surgical guide. So this is the surgical guide that my lab was able to create. And they gave me these little anchor pins that are really, they, they look intimidating. The, these are these... Um, little anchor pins here. Remember, this patient doesn't have any teeth. So I couldn't um, I couldn't snap on this uh, surgical guide. And so what I did instead was I asked my lab to create anchor pins. And those anchor pins, you just basically screw into the bone to anchor the surgical guide in place so that it doesn't move. So that it's, it's held in nicely and stable. I know some of you have the question right now, hey, Gupta, did you lay a flap? Did you lay a flap? And my answer is not at this point, because remember the, the technician who made this, they made it based on, on the soft tissue impression that you gave them. And so the only way for me to hold that surgical guide in place was with it supported by soft tissue. So what I do is I put the surgical guide in place, have the patient bite on it, and then I stabilize it with those anchor pins. And then my first step in the surgery is just to use a pilot drill, a simple pilot drill, make sure that I go all the way to length with the pilot drill, and then I remove my surgical guide, and then I lay a flap. And the reason why, is because the surgical guide is going to guide me to do it the right way, but the flap is gonna confirm that I'm gonna do it the right way. So stabilize your surgical guide, do your pilot drill, maybe do your second set of drills, but then remove the whole thing, lay a flap, and make sure that those holes are within bone and they're nice. In this case, she had some pretty thick bone there, so. Um, there was room for error, but I like where those two implants are. And this case, it's going to restore beautifully. It's just going to restore awesome. I mean, those two implants, even though there's rocking that can be expected with two implants, they're pretty far away from each other. She's going to be really happy with her case. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about a CBCT. Um, I love my CBCT. I think it's the greatest. Um, it's so cool. It's fun to look at. Patients think I'm like some super awesome dentist because I have a CBCT. Um, I can plan implants. I can, I can look at airways. There's coolness. I, I love it. Um, but I, I want to talk to you a little bit about having this technology because more and more dentists are, are having, they have CBCTs now. More I, When I go and give this course live, half the dentists in the room generally are the ones raising their hands saying they have a CBCT. Why do we get sued? Anybody think, why do we get sued? Well, we can get sued for a variety of reasons, but we only lose primarily because of one reason. We lose lawsuits because of something called failure to diagnose. That's the reason we lose lawsuits. The number one reason that we lose lawsuits is because a person might have periodontal disease. We don't tell them about it. They end up losing their teeth and they sue us because we never diagnose their periodontal disease. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the power to diagnose with all of the technology that you have in your office. Well, first of all, before I talk about that, the one thing I do wanna remind you all. So, so when I was giving this course, um, I called up my, my um, medical malpractice insurance carrier, it's MedPro, um, and I asked to talk to their head lawyer. And I said, okay, what, what, when do we lose and how can we avoid it? And he actually told me, one of the best things you can do is don't just pull their tongue. Uh, I'm pretty much all of you on this call. When we do an exam, we pull on people's tongues, right? Um, don't just pull on their tongue. Say, hey, the reason I'm pulling on your tongue is to check your soft tissue for any cancer. So you say it to the patient, I am pulling your tongue to check for cancer. And then you document that you did an oral cancer screening and it was within normal limits, okay? And the next thing is, if you do see something unusual, so let's say you see some little white blob and you're like, huh, that's kind of weird looking. Um, you take your intraoral camera, you take a picture of it. 
and you and you send the patient home and you say, listen, come back in two weeks. I just want to see if this thing has gotten bigger or worse. If that patient cancels their appointment, but they end up getting cancer, that's kind of on you. So if you see something that's unusual, you need to be persistent. Tell the patient, hey, you got to come back here and tell your front desk. If this patient cancels, you got to be persistent. Tell them to make the keep to, to reschedule. I want to see if that white blob there is still there. Okay. So the problem with having a CBCT is that now you have this incredible diagnostic tool in your office that you're using regularly, but you don't have, you don't, I don't, your colleagues don't, none of us have the radiographic expertise to be able to read that stupid thing. I don't know what like a some random soft tissue growth in a CBCT looks like. And so all of my CBCTs, 100% of the CBCTs that I take in my office, they seamlessly and automatically, they get sent to an, an oral radiologist who's going to read, document, and report back to me their findings, okay? We lose when we get sued when we fail to diagnose, okay? Um, so this is a, this is a, an image that we all, those of us who own a CBCT, we see this image. I don't see anything weird because I'm not looking for it. And an oral radiologist was able to look at it and find that it was an actual adenoid cystic carcinoma. This was not one of my cases, but I will tell you this one right here is one of my cases. Um, this is a lady who she needed all of her teeth pulled. Um, we were going to make her a surgical guide. We did all of the implant planning, took a CBCT. The CBCT was automatically uh, read by a oral radiologist. And the report that I got back had a big, in big red letters, it said the words critical. And the critical, uh, the reason it was critical was because the radiologist found a 2.0 by 2.0 by 2.8 centimeter expansile mass expanding the pituitary fossa with extension into the sphenoidal sinus. Correlate clinically and additional follow-up with imaging is recommended. Okay, I think there's 192 of you. There's no way even one of you, even the most cocky, arrogant one that's listening to this call, thinks that they can find a expansile mass expanding the pituitary fossa with extension to the sphenoidal sinus. None of us can do it. We do class two composites. We do uh, uh, premolar root canals. We don't know what the hell we're looking at with these CBCTs. So what did I do with this patient? I, I live in Cleveland. I sent this patient to the Cleveland Clinic uh, Neurology Department. Um, it was it was a tumor. It was a mass, and she um, she's going to have it removed. Um, and she's incredibly grateful. And I just want to share with you another one that I just got this week. Um, wait, let me pause this. Carotid atherosclerotic disease present. Reference details and recommendations above. This I just got it this week. I just added this to my slides. I got this this week. The dude's got an atherosclerotic plaque in his carotid artery. He's going to get a stroke. He could either become disabled or die. And this guy came to me because he wanted a dental implant. And I'm able now to completely prevent this from happening. This guy's incredibly grateful. And I just want to read you this um, message that I got uh, earlier this uh, back in 2022. Dr. Gupta, I have a story to tell you. Years ago, you did a routine x-ray of my teeth and found a blocked carotid artery in the scan. You told me to go to the ER or my doctor immediately. Everyone at the doctor's office was amazed that a dentist caught this. Since then, they put me on blood thinners for three months, put me on blood thinners for three months out of the, out of the year. And every November, I go in for an ultrasound to check it. Each year, it got better. In, in 19, I went in and was told your blockage was all gone, but you might want to have this other thing looked at. After some tests, in December of 2019, I was diagnosed with HPV head and neck cancer in my tonsils. I went through the most brutal treatment of chemo and 35 radiation treatments. An aggressive cancer, but the highest cure rate. June 25th, I will be celebrating three years cancer-free. Doctors told me don't worry about reoccurrence at this point because after two years, the rate is very, very low. Since treatment, I live my life to the fullest, have an absolute wonderful relationship with my wife, 
because of her caregiving. I also have sat back and been very mindful of all, all my nurses and doctors that helped me through this. You always pop into my head. Had you not seen the blockage, I would not have had the yearly scans. If I did not have the yearly scans, my stage one cancer could have been stage four in just months. I have said, if I ever see you around, I live in this town, I would walk up to you, shake your hand, give you a bro hug and cry my eyes out. So if you ever have some weirdo dude come up to you and crying and hugging, you now now you know why. Thank you, sir. I will always remember what you've done for me. And uh, I, I've read this numerous times. I feel emotional every time I read it because I had the opportunity to change somebody's life. And um, I wouldn't have found that carotid plaque. I wouldn't have found it because I wasn't looking for it. I look at teeth. I look at gums. I look at bone. I don't look at all that other stuff. You have an opportunity to change people's lives. Uh, the company that I use, the company that I use to um, seamlessly and automatically have all of my CTs read is Dental Ray. They, they, their IT people, they put something into my into the computer that I use uh, for all my CBCTs. The CBCTs get read automatically, and the report is sent directly to me. It's awesome. Um, this uh, company, Dental Ray, is also one of the sponsors of today's course. Okay. Now, I do want to talk briefly. If you don't have a CBCT, I, I would be totally, totally insincere if I said you shouldn't be freehanding these cases. I spent years of my career freehanding these cases. Okay. This is what I'm going to tell you. These are very profitable cases. As you do these very profitable cases, don't use that extra money to buy like I don't know, uh, a, a movie theater system in your basement or a, a nice patio, nice patio for, use that freaking money to buy a CBCT. You're just gonna become better and better at this, at this job if you have a CBCT. If you don't have a CBCT, you can always send a patient to an imaging center and have a CBCT done. And a scanner, those of you who don't have a scanner, there are labs now that give you scanners. They're, they don't charge you anything. Um, one lab that you probably have seen a lot of marketing for, they're not a sponsor for this event. They're not one of my sponsors in any way, but I use this lab. It's dandy. It's because they gave me a freaking scanner. And then when I started get, doing more volume with them, they gave me another scanner. So now I have two scanners in my office that I got for free. Scan, use them. They're, they're available now and they're free. And so use them. Okay, now, before I finish up, I need to talk to you about one more surgical aspect. Now, after you place these implants and you stitch the person up, um, and, and, and you gotta be like nice to them and deal with all of their complaining about their interim denture, at some point those implants are gonna integrate, okay? At some point, usually around six months, if the patient's a major smoker, wait longer, around six months, they're gonna, they're going to be ready to get their denture and they're going to be like, they're going to be like, okay, can I get my like denture that snaps in yet? Um, the problem is all of your integrated implants that you did such a beautiful job placing, they're all under the surface. I mean, look at how nice this case is, it's a beautiful case, but look at how it looked uh, clinically. When the page came back, I could find two of those implants. Those are pretty easy to find. Where the hell do I even drill on these two anterior? I, I have no idea what to do here. And if you just start guessing willy-nilly where those implants are, you're going to have a situation uh, similar to this one in the next slide here. Um, this is the, the same patient's lowers. Um, okay, I think the implants here. So I use my little diode laser and I'm digging away at tissue. And I'm like, I don't really feel the implant. Well, maybe it's a little bit more buckle, so I continue with my diode. I'm not really finding it here. Oh, there it is. There it is. So after I gouged this gigantic hole out of the patient, now I found my stupid implant. That ain't cool. The patient's going to be pain in pain. There's going to be all this time to for them to heal. Don't do that. So how can you find your implants? Well, you could do a full flap, and that's effective. The only problem is patients aren't going to be that happy that you're going to get their whole mouth numb and jack up their entire gingiva. 
Okay, this is where I think you should retain the surgical guide. Remember that surgical guide that you used? Go find it, wipe off all that clotted blood that was stuck to it and stick the surgical guide in. Or you can use a healing. Let, let me go through each one, okay? First one is retaining the surgical guide. Let's watch this video here. This guy, um, I use a surgical guide to place his implants. Then this is the same guy where I had no idea where his two anterior implants were. So I stuck the surgical guide back on. I used a Q-tip to kind of see the, the kind of the center of the surgical guide. And that's where I aimed when I started cutting away tissue, looking for those implants. And it actually worked out really well, very beautifully. I cut away just enough tissue to find those implants, okay? But another idea that I want to recommend that not a lot of, that you're not going to hear from a lot of CE courses, because I think, I think I invented this. I don't know. I don't want to give myself too much credit, but I think I invented this, okay? It's you guess where the implants are. Let's say you threw away your surgical guide or it's unusable now or whatever. Um, take your laser and gouge just a tiny little, like just a tiny little gouge out of the gums. And then take flowable composite and ooze a little bit of flowable composite just around where you laze that, right? So you just squirt some flowable composite, like inject it where you used your laser. Then cure it and send the patient to get a panoramic x-ray. And if you see here, I guessed really good for this implant around tooth number 10, but I wasn't even close with my implant around tooth number 14. So now I know that I have to guess a little bit further distal. And so that's what I do now. If I don't have a healing cap or a surgical guide that's going to tell me exactly where I need to um, cut away gum tissue, I use this composite technique. Lays a little bit, so you create kind of like a tiny hole in the gums, and then inject some composite and take a panoramic x-ray. And then you'll know exactly how close you are, how good your guess was. Look how far away I was with my guesses on the other side. And so I will repeat this process until my composite is right over the implants, and then it's easy. Then I can just start removing the gingiva where that composite is, and my implants will be right below. Now I found my implants. The last thing that I'm going to talk about, because it's 8.50 and I want to have 10 minutes for questions. So once you've found your implants, it's good to test your implants to see what their stability is. I use something called a penguin. Um, another company uses something called the Austel. I have no idea which is better or either of them is better. I just happen to buy the penguin and that's the one I use. Uh, and so basically what I do is I screw this, um, this little metal component into my implant and then I use the penguin and the penguin gives me an actual score that shows how stable my implants are in the tissue. And now I have something documentable to show how stable those implants are so that I can feel comfortable getting the green light to start the process of restoring the implant. All right, I believe that's it. So um, in order to get a hold of me or access my handouts, you can go to bebetterseminars.com or catapulteducation.com or, and I'm being totally serious here, you can just send me an email. I try really hard. Listen, I'm old now. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, at, at this phase of my life where I need to make the maximum amount of money. I, I just, I like helping people. And so if you just have a question, you're like, dude, Gupta, I have, I, I'm doing my first case in a couple of weeks. I'm nervous as hell. Shoot me an email and let's walk through it together. Um, because I'm old, I'm kind of in the phase of my life where I just want to help people. And uh, let me help you out. Uh, I, I try not to charge anything or anything like that. Of course, you know, if I like visit your office, I'm going to charge you something, but uh, I kind of just want to help you out. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, I want to thank Implant Direct. Implant Direct is the company that um, provides me with my implants, with my surgical components. Um, Implant Direct is excellent if you are just getting started with the process of placing implants. And Dental Ray is the go to company that I use um, when uh, interpreting radiographs. So, with that said,
I'm going to open up the Q&A first, and then I'll open up the chat, and I'm going to see if I can get all of your questions answered here, okay? So I stop my share. So now, uh, now you got to see my stupid face. Um, let me open up the Q&A. All right, Hugh. Um, Unker, you have a great partnership. Who is your lab tech? Hugh, I use Dandy. Dandy, they were the ones who gave me my um, scanner, and they are very sophisticated with surgical guide uh, fabrication. They're excellent. Um, so thank you, Hugh. So the company, again, is Dandy. Uh, Nicole Arsenault. Oh, uh, your name sounds familiar. I think you've you've uh, attended some of my lectures in the past. Is the ADA billing code for Bonecraft plug the same as the particular? Yes, it is. It is. Um, Nicole, I, since I'm a home and I don't have my chart in front of me, I don't know. I can't remember what my code is for bone grafting. But if you want to send me an email, um, I will respond to your email tomorrow and tell you what my code is. Okay. But yeah, I use the same code for, for the plug and for particulate, which is total crap because the plug takes me like 20 seconds and a particulate graph takes me like an hour. Um, oh, good. Surpreet Aurora, um, she, she, uh, or, or he, I apologize, Surpreet. Um, he, uh, he uh, indicated that it is, uh, um, let me open up my chat here. It's D7953. So Nicole, if you are still, Nicole, if you are still um, on the call, uh, then there's your answer. Um, okay. Uh, Nasima, osteoplug for bone grafting is made of what material? Is patient allergic to? Okay, that's actually a really good uh, question. It is made out of bovine tendon, I think. Bovine tendon. Mm. Hey, Surpreet, since you're like so awesome and I'm totally relying on you, can you uh, Google what like osteoplug or um, Mineros by uh, by uh, BioHorizons, any of these plugs, what they're made of? I think they're made out of tendon. Um, bovine Achilles tendon. Dude, Surpreet, you're, you're the best. <laughs> Thank you. It's bovine Achilles tendon. Um, okay. Emily. Sibinski, Skibinski, what is the ADA code for the surgical guide? I don't, okay, I have, there's the ADA code for the CBCT, and, but I don't charge for a surgical guide. I, I probably could, I probably should, I don't. Um, <laughs> so Preet, if you charge for a surgical guide, what code do you use? Um, but I, I only charge for the CBCT because I'm getting charged by Dental Ray to have it professionally interpreted. And so um, I make sure to charge the patient a, a, a pretty affordable amount. I, I only charge $100 for a CBCT. And that, that $100 will also um, apply for the surgical guide. Um, my implants, I... I feel like my fee for the surgical placement of the implant is so expensive that I kind of cover my costs that way. Um, sorry, Emily, I wish I had a better answer there for you. Um, Alpana, I think Alpana, your name looks familiar too. So I think you were on my last lecture too. So thanks for coming back. Uh, Dental Ray, I, I give them quite a bit of volume uh, with the amount of CBCTs that I do. So they charge me $70. But your your rate might be different based on how many CBCTs you do. Also, because Dental Ray sees me as somewhat of a uh, promotional asset because I'm so happy with their service and I talk about them in my lectures, I might have a little bit more of a discounted rate. So I don't want you to quote me with $70, but it's going to be in that ballpark, um, what Dental Ray will charge. Um, actually, if any, uh, uh, Trevor or Caleb, if you are... Okay, wait, um, Emily, Surpreet, my, my, my assistant Surpreet uh, has an answer for you. Surpreet charge it, does the D6190 code for the surgical guide. And then Surpreet, are you, are you billing that to insurance? Are you getting any reimbursement for that? I'm, I'm curious about that because maybe I need to start ch charging for it. Um, okay, so Nasima, what is the name of my CBCT? Okay, I'm going to answer this. I own the VATEC CBCT, but I regret it. 
I have seen the Prexion machine and I like the Prexion image better. I hope nobody from Vitek is on this call because you're going to be mad at me. But I have a Vitek. I like my Vitek. But now that I've seen the Prexion images, I would rather have had a Prexion because they're about in the same price point. And so there's lots of CBCTs on the market. What I would recommend you do is look at the images of lots of different CBCTs. My vote, if I could go back in time and buy a CBCT, I would buy the Prexion. Um, Tanuja, can you please tell me more about Oval Minis? Sure. So, um, so, so the difference between an Oval Mini and a traditional implant is not the fact that an Oval is like smaller. Uh, there's fat Ovals. There, there's fat mini implants. There's long mini implants. There, it's not the implant. It's the fact that an Oval is one piece. So there's the implant component that goes into the bone. And then there's the oval component, which becomes the locator. I don't like that. I don't like it that it's one piece because what you're going to find when you do these surgeries is people's gums, they change after surgery. The gums, they, 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 they're a different height after surgery or after several years, the gums have receded a little bit. And you got this super long restorative component. I like the idea of using a traditional implant so I can replace my locator over time, or I can use a different size locator that I had initially planned um, when, when it's after a patient has healed. And so Oval Minis, I only use to stabilize the interim denture at the time of surgery. I do not use them as a long-term solution. I've gotten burned too many times. Hopefully that answers your question, Thanuja. Um, okay. Hey, uh, Surpreet. Oh, wait, your email is right here. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot you an email because I'm actually curious. Uh, I'd like to know from your office manager whether or not you're getting reimbursed ever by insurance for the 6190 code. I really do appreciate you helping me um, with this. Misty Blue, 911. Dr. Gupta, do you ever use your surgical guide to place your implants flapless? Very good question. I do, but I wanted to teach you all as if you all are just getting started with dental implants, okay? I'm really experienced. I've, I've placed so many implants in my life now that I do flapless cases when I know the case is just, it's, it's a slam dunk. There's no way I can F it up without doing flap. You know, there's no way I'm going to screw it up. So I still, so I'll go flapless, but I don't want to encourage any of you to do that. The only way you can see where the bone is, the only way that you can really see where your osteotomy, your drill, your implant is with respect to the bone is to see the bone. And so I'm not going to recommend that you go flapless until you become as become really experienced and really comfortable. Uh, Dr. Sarab, I, Sarab Srivastava. I feel like your name looks familiar too. Or maybe I think all the Indian people have recognizable names because I have like some uncle or something like that that has a similar name. Anyway, um, in your surgical guide example, you used a parallel pin to help confirm the insertion of the implant. Was the, in, the parallel pin also built into your guide? You know, that's such a good question. That parallel pin was from, that parallel pin was the actual O ball that I had placed, okay? So I called it a parallel pin and that was my apologies because I misled you. I placed a one piece O ball for this patient because I knew this patient was gonna be a pain in the butt about the interim denture. And so I wanted to stabilize the interim denture with the O ball. And that's what I used as my kind of, um, it was a parallel guide, but it was actually the O-ball implant, okay? Do I'm sorry, Dr. Sarab, for, for misleading you uh, in the lecture. Anonymous attendee, how much do you charge for your CBCT? I charge $100. Listen, I'm old. My house is paid off. My practice is paid off. My kids are old. Um, I, I don't recommend you charge as little as I charge. Charge $250, charge $500. I charge $100 because I feel like I'm, 
I'm just, I'm okay with that financially. But that doesn't mean that you should be doing the same thing. Charge what you think is appropriate. Your CBCT was expensive as hell. You should charge for that, okay? My fee doesn't need to be your fee. Danuja, how do we replace them? Let me go back to your original question. Can you tell me about the O-ball? Tanuja, you don't replace them. That's the problem. You don't replace O-balls. That's why I don't do them. When I have an O-ball that's worn out, you know what I do? I flap the tissue and, I, and I'm like Paul Bunyan with an ax. I cut the freaking O-ball right off. And now the patient has a completely unusable implant stuck in their jaw. You don't, you cannot replace an O-ball. And that's why I don't use them as long-term solutions. Brendan, do you ever measure from the midline for determining implant placement? I, I do. Brendan, I, I wanted to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to encourage anybody being a total cowboy and freehanding their cases. I think using a surgical guide is the wisest way to go. But of course, I did a lot of freehanding before I started using a surgical guide regularly. And your method there, Brendan, is, is very good. You find the midline. You know you want your two implants to be 10 millimeters apart. So you measure five millimeters to the left and five millimeters to the right so that those two implants are gonna be 10 millimeters apart and they're going to be equidistant from the midline. So Brendan, that was a great question, but I just didn't wanna encourage it because I wanna encourage the use of surgical guides as much as possible. For uncover, do you use Augma for grafting? You know what, Brendan, I need to learn about Augma because I don't know what it is. Um, but thank you, for, thank you for bringing it up. I don't know what Augma is. Trevor, uh, hey, Trevor from Dental. Oh, Trevor, this is you, Trevor. Okay, great. So Dental Ray is on this call. Um, we start at $70 per report. Oh, okay. So I don't pay. Okay. So at least I don't think I pay. I don't know what I pay. Trevor, you probably know how much I pay. But when I first got involved with Dental Ray, they were charging me $70. I believe I have a discounted rate. So they go down, they, but depending on how many CBCTs you send to them, they can you can go down to $50 per report, which is pretty cool. So Trevor, thank you for um, thank you for jumping in and answering that question. But 70 bucks, that's nothing. I mean, patients, patients will pay that. If you say, listen, um, this thing, it shows you your bone height, your bone, uh, your bone quality, the health of your teeth, your airway. And it, and it also has the opportunity to check for any type of head and neck cancer. And we charge $70. Patients are going to pay that. They're going to pay a hundred bucks. They're going to pay $150 to, for me to have the peace of mind of knowing that there's no cancer from here up. Most people will pay that. Uh, Tanuja, doctor, when you do not have enough bone height in the posterior region, in the maxillary, do you do angular implants and what kind of precautions do you take? Tanuja, I have been burned too many times using angular implants, okay? I mean, implants that are angled so bad, it is really hard to correct for them with locators. What I would much rather you do is learn the Versa system, the Versa system for um, atraumatically adding graft material into the sinus so that you can place a parallel implant or place a tiny, short, little, little puny implant in the posterior. Place a 4.5 by 7 millimeter implant in the posterior. That thing's going to integrate pretty well and it's going to stabilize that denture pretty well. But don't overangulate. It's you're. I, I'm telling you, I've done this too many times, and I've gotten burned too many times. Overangulating and hoping to correct for that at the restorative phase, that's like a pipe dream. Okay. Misty blue. Last question. Why not just remove the mini implants prior to rest? Why not remove the mini implants? No way, man. I'm gonna keep those mini implants as long as I. Misty. Yo, listen, those mini implants are probably going to wear out and become useless in 10 years. But when, when they're integrated and they're sticking up out of the gums and it's time for me to make that denture, I'm going to use them because that's two more implants that are going to provide stability along with my traditional implants and locators. 
So sorry, Misty, I'm not removing those things. If they're loose and crappy or the gum is all inflamed around them, fine, I'll remove them. But those things integrate and uh, I'm going to keep them in there. Okay, NOM is more than 10 millimeters between implants better? So NOM, that's actually a great question. Um, Having having a, a well distributed set of implants. So let's say you had an implant under thirty and nineteen, and an implant between twenty seven and twenty two. That's like that's perfect. That's that's barring any anatomical problems or you know the mental nerve or any. Imagine you had an implant thirty, nineteen, twenty two, and twenty six. It would be perfect, and that would be more than ten millimeters apart. I'm going to tell you that's more unrealistic. You start to get into concavities and weird anatomical issues. And a lot of times my four lower implants are pretty much from premolar to premolar, about 10 millimeters apart. But if I can extend them and distribute them under the denture even more, that's great. But sometimes that's not possible. Oh, Hugh, you had asked, uh, you missed the name for uh, name of the lab. The lab is Dandy, Dandy Lab. Um, they they market a lot. Like I feel like I see their name everywhere. They're the ones that give you the free CBCT and they're very good with implant planning. Uh, Tanuja, when you need to place implants to replace two teeth, like two number 19 and 20, how much space do you maintain between the two? Oh, that's a great question, Tanuja. Um, I, the, okay, so you're talking about for a, a just, crowns, right? Fixed crowns. Um, I actually have a slide with rules um, uh, for with all of the different rules for placement um, for traditional implants. Um, I want my two implants from the very extent of the very furthest thread to the very extent of the very furthest thread of the, on the adjacent implant, at least four millimeters apart. Now, I know some of you are like, wait, I learned it was three millimeters. And some of you are like, hey, hang on. I learned it was five. Who cares? Just make sure that there's a pretty nice amount of bone separating the mo the furthest extent of the threads of those two um, adjacent implants. Uh, Dr. Shristava, how long do you wait for the implants to integrate? So that's a great question. I'm in my late 40s. I don't smoke and I'm a pretty healthy guy. If somebody like me came in, I wouldn't even wait more than three months. I would start. I would start working on that denture pretty quick. If it was some, uh, if it was a eighty-year-old osteoporosis lady who's who smoked her whole life, I'm going to tell her that we're going to wait eighteen months, and that a couple of those implants are probably going to fail. I'm going to give her the worst possible uh, expectations, and then maybe I might fudge those expectations and give her her denture a little bit sooner than that. But everybody's different. Uh, one of the patients that you saw on this slide, he's a 42-year-old African-American man with just incredibly dense bone. I could have restored his implants the day of. I bet I could have added locators, given him a denture that same day, because that bone was like granite. And so you don't really want to have a rule for how long you should wait. Look at your patients, determine the density of the bone that they have, and then make your decision based on that. The other thing, Dr. Shristava, is you can use your penguin to test the stability of the, of the implant on the day of surgery. And that'll give you a much better indication of how stable that implant is on the day of surgery. Uh, Nicole, do you like and still use the scanner by Dandy? Yeah, the Dandy scanner is a trios, um, uh, what's it called, a three shape. It's a three shape by trios, I think it's fine. Um, I've used an Itero. I feel like they're about the same. Uh, I've used a Medit. The cool thing about a Medit is it's wireless, which is really cool. Um, the one scanner that I think is superior to all those other scanners is the Prime Scan that, by Patterson. Um, that's just a super awesome scanner. Um, but it's a question of spending $25,000 for a scanner or spending $0 on a scanner. I, I'm going to spend zero dollars on the scanner. And I, I like my my trios, the three shape. Um, let me go to the chat really quick and see. Um, okay, I'm going to start here. 
How long have you had your own CBCT? This was asked by Andrew O. Andrew, if you're still on, we bought our CBCT one year before COVID. No, we upgraded our CBCT before COVID. We got our CBCT in 2018. Um, let's see. When you try to locate your implant with the flowable composite, can you do a PA? Yeah, of course. Um, it's annoying to have the patient walk all the way over to the panoramic machine. Yeah, just do a PA. Um, the reason I do a pan is because it's four different sites. And so it's just easier um, with, uh, with the pan. But if you were doing like, let's say um, a single tooth or something like that, yeah, do a PA. What is the name of the technique to place grafting material into the sinus? Versa, V-E-R-S-A-H. Tanuja, if you are still logged in, Versa is, so, it, it's, it's a set of burrs that you actually rotate um, uh, in reverse. And um, so what they do is they can't cut, but what they do is they dense, they, they, they make your bone graft densely uh, packed into that bone. And Anonymous said, thank you very much. Oh, um, do you have a hands-on course? Anonymous attendee, let me tell you about the hands-on courses. What I will do is I'm going to update my website with all of my courses. And then that way you can see if there's a course that's close to home that you'd like to attend, um, uh, that you can sign up for it, okay? For those of you who are still on, I apologize for going so far over, um, but I think you learned a lot. I hope you did. Um, so thanks everyone for being on the call and um, just have a great rest of your night. Thanks everyone.